Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort has been made to be as doctrinally and historically accurate as possible. Every day a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants will be released. I hope that you'll visit this often and be able to share this uh, with your friends. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. This is going to be for the Joseph Smith History, verses 1 through 26. So this will get us through the first vision and a little bit beyond that, and then we'll do another podcast going forward. All right, let me just read a little background first. It was decreed in the councils of eternity, long before the foundations of the earth were laid, that he, Joseph Smith, should be the man in the last dispensation of this world to bring forth the word of God, to the people and receive the fullness of the keys and power of the priesthood of the Son of God. The Lord had his eyes upon him and upon his father and upon his father's father and upon their po- their progenitors, clear back to, a- uh, to Abraham and from Abraham to the flood and from the flood to Enoch and from Enoch to Adam. He, w- he has watched that family and that blood as it has circulated from the fountain to the birth of that man. And that was by Brigham Young. There are at least four accounts of the first vision, either written or dictated by the prophet. The variations in the details of the accounts further validates the truthfulness of the events. I'm going to read just a little bit about each of these uh, before we get into the main one. But uh, this first one is a recital of the 1832 account. This account of 1832 was recorded as a rough draft. The style was was not polished, nor was it published by the prophet. It is possible that after dictating the account, Joseph recognized the desirability of modifying certain statements or correcting concepts not accurately written by an untrained scribe. Often, when people record biographical sketches or historical incidents, they write and rewrite until their ideas are clearly expressed. Although this account of 1832 is not as well written nor as comprehensive as later recitals, Joseph revealed one concept in this version which sheds some light on the historical setting of the first vision. Since the prophet stated that for two or three years he had been engaged in a quest for religious truth, it is apparent that his search for God's true church was not a sudden, not a sudden impulse. During his investigation, he became confused. There were occasions when he reflected on the possibility that an apostasy had occurred and that there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Nevertheless, the young man continued to examine the religions or the religious societies consisted or constituted in the place where he lived and possibly desired to learn what Christians in other parts of the world believed. In a later recital, the prophet indicated his bewilderment when he said, who of all these parties are right, or are, are they all wrong together? And if any one of them be right, which is it, and how shall I know it? An 1835 account, the shortest known recital of the first vision, uh, which was dictated by Joseph to scribe, occurred in 1835. This account, recorded by Warren Cowdery, was included as part of a conversation between Joseph Smith and Robert Matthias, who had adopted the priestly name of Joshua. Joseph explained his first communication to this visitor. After mentioning that a personage appeared in the midst of a pillar of fire, he said that another personage soon appeared like unto the first and and informed Joseph that his sins had been forgiven. Then Joseph said, according to this account, I saw many angels in this vision. The recital of 1838, the most comprehensive account of the first vision, was prepared for publication as part of Joseph's multi-volume History of the Church and was originally dictated by the prophet in 1838. This recital was undoubtedly uh, carefully recorded and might have undergone several revisions to improve the style and wording. The version of this account, which has been preserved, is in the handwriting of James Mulholland, who served as scribe for the prophet in 1839, indicating that the recital was rewritten after its initial recording. The Wentworth Letter, a second account, which was prepared for publication, was written for non-members of the church in 1841. At the request of John Wentworth, editor of the Chicago Democrat, Joseph was asked to prepare a brief history of the church, which he had founded. Joseph complied and added to the history 13 unnumbered statements of belief, which are widely known today as the Articles of Faith. All right, so here's a heading of the first uh, 20 verses. It says, Joseph Smith 
<clears throat> tells of his ancestry, family members, and their in their early abodes. An unusual excitement about religion prevails in western New York. He determines to seek wisdom as directed by James. The father and the son appear, and Joseph is called to his prophetic ministry. Verse 1. Owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons in relation to the rise and progress of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all of which have been designed by the authors thereof to mitigate or to militate against its character as a church and its progress in the world, I have been induced to write this history to disabuse the public mind and put all inquirer, inquirers after truth in possession of the facts as they have transpired in relation both to myself and the church so far as I have been so far as I have had such facts in my possession. In December of 1841, the prophet Joseph Smith lamented, Since I have been engaged in laying the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I have been prevented in various ways from continuing my journal and history in a manner satisfactory to myself or in justice to the cause. Long imprisonments, vexations, and long-continued lawsuits, the treachery of some of my clerks, the death of others, and the poverty of myself and brethren from continued plunder and driving have prevented my handing down to posterity a connected memorandum of events desirable to all lovers of truth. Yet I have continued to keep up a journal in the best manner my circumstances would allow and dictate for my history from time to time, as I have had opportunities so that the labors and suffering of the first elders and saints of this last kingdom might not wholly be lost to the world. The history of the church begun in 1838 was the first fully organized attempt to place the events that had transpired in relation to the restoration of the gospel into a comprehensive and chronologically arranged record. That was by Joseph Philly McConkie. Verse 2. <clears throat> in this history, I shall present the various events in relation to this church in truth and righteousness as they have transpired or as they at present exist, being now 1838, the eighth year since the organization of the said church. I was born in the year of our Lord, 1805, on the 23rd day of December, in the town of, Sh of Sharon, Windsor County, state of Vermont. My father, Joseph Smith Sr., left the state of Vermont and moved to Palmyra, Ontario, now Wayne County, in the state of New York, when I was in my 10th year, 1815, or thereabouts. In about four years after my father's arrival in Palmyra, he moved with his family into Manchester, in the same county of Ontario. It is evident that God directed the movements of Joseph Smith Sr.'s family, eventually guiding them to the area of Palmyra and Manchester, New York, so that they would be near the Hill Camorra. During the first 20 years of his and Lucy's marriage, they relocated nine times. Throughout this period, Joseph Sr. farmed, operated a mercantile business, crystallized ginseng root to be exported to China, and taught school. While the family was living in Lebanon, New Hampshire, typhus fever spread throughout New England. Young Joseph Jr. attracted this disease, and an abscess uh, spread into the tibia of his left leg. The common medical practice of the day prescribed amputation of the affected limb. However, a short distance from the Smith home at Dartmouth Medical College, Dr. Nathan Smith taught another method for treating the abscess that saved the leg of afflicted individuals. The providence of the Lord placed the Smith family in the only known location in the world where such a procedure was practiced. The result was that Joseph, Joseph's, or that young Joseph's leg was not amputated. Three years of crop failure in Norwich, Vermont, precipitated the family's eventual move to Palmyra, New York. The year 1816, known as the year without summer, the eruption of the volcanic Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa, east of Java, in 1815 caused changes in the atmosphere. The volcanic ash and debris shaded the sun's rays, and many believe that this caused snow to fall in June and July in the New England states. Coming after several years of hardships, the crop failure was more than the Smith family could handle. This, was, this with other factors, caused them to leave Vermont. Packing their belongings, they moved to Palmyra, New York, where young Joseph was to receive a series of remarkable visions and the Book of Mormon. Verse 4, his family consisting of 11 souls, namely my father Joseph, 
who was 48 years at the time of the first vision, my mother Lucy, Ma Lucy Smith, whose name previous to her marriage was Mac, a daughter of Solomon Mac, my brothers Alvin, who died November 19, 1823, in the 26th year of his age, Hiram, myself, Samuel Harrison, William, Don Carlos, and my sisters Sophronia, Catherine, and Lucy. Lucy was born after the first vision in 1821. Sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement of the, on the subject of religion. It commenced with the Methodists, but soon became general among all the sects in that religion of country. Indeed, the whole district of, of country seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst the people, some crying low here and others low there. Some were contending with the, for the Methodist faith, some for the Presbyterian, and some for the Baptist. Many contemporary records confirm Joseph Smith's testimony of religious excitement in the place where he lived prior to the first vision. Methodists held camp meetings east of the Smith farm, and many of these meetings could have been considered by an earnest seeker after truth as ones which generated unusual religious excitement. In the summer of 1819, Methodists of the Genesee Conference held an annual meeting in Phelps, then Vienna, and more than 100 ministers, including the Reverend George Lane, attended this July gathering. Verse 6, <clears throat> For notwithstanding the great love which the converts of the, to these different faiths expressed at the time of their conversion, and the great zeal manifested by the respective clergy who were active in getting up and promoting this extraordinary scene of religious feeling, in order to have everybody converted as they were pleased to call it, let them join what sect they pleased, and yet they yet when the converts began to file off, some to one party and some to another, it was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real, for a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued. Priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that all their good feelings, one for another, if they ever had any, were, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest of, about opinions. I was at this time in my fifteenth year. My father's family was proselyted to the Presbyterian faith, and four of them joined that church, namely my mother Lucy, my brothers Hiram and Samuel Harrison, and my sister Sophronia. During this time of great excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness, but though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties, though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. In process of time, my mind became somewhat partial to the Methodist sect, and I felt some desire to be united with them. But so great was, were the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I was, and so unacquainted with men and things, to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. My mind at times was greatly excited. The cry and tumult were so great and incessant. The Presbyterians were most decided against the Baptists and Methodists, and used all the powers of both reason and sophistry to prove their errors, or at least to make the people think they were in error. On the other hand, the Baptists and Methodists in their turn were equally zealous in endeavoring to establish their own tenets and disprove all others. In the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions, I often said to myself, what is to be done? Who of all these parties are right, or are they all wrong together? If any one of them be right, which is it, and how shall I know it? By searching the scriptures, Joseph explained, I found that mankind did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith, and there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, as recorded in the New Testament. And I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world, for I learned in the scriptures that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 11, while I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the contests of these parties of religionists, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. In an interview in 1893, the year before his death, William Smith, younger brother of the prophet, recalled the background of Joseph's reading this passage of scripture. There was a joint revival in the neighborhood between the Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians, and they had succeeded in stirring up quite a feeling, and after the meeting the question arose which church should have the converts. Reverend Stockton was the president of the meeting and suggested it was their meeting and under their care and that and they had a church 
there and they ought to join the Presbyterians, but his father did not like the Reverend Stockton very well. Our folks hesitated, and the next evening a Reverend Mr. Lane of the Methodists preached a, a sermon on what church shall which church shall I join? And the burden of the disclosure was to ask God, using as a text, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally. And of course, when Joseph went home and was looking over the text, he was impressed to do just what the preacher had said. And going out in, in the woods with childlike, simple, trusting faith, believing that God meant just what he said, he kneeled down and prayed. Verse 12, never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did, for how to act I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know, for the teachers of religion of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. In the description of his feelings as he read James 1.5, Joseph Smith gives us a perfect description of the spirit of revelation. The key elements in that description include the force with which the message of the text entered, in, entered his heart, the attendant feelings, and the manner in which he reflected upon it again and again. It is an interesting, or it is an everlasting pattern that revelation begets revelation. Here, Joseph Smith receives a revelation directing him to what we now know as the sacred grove. This may well be the most instructive passage in Holy Writ on how truth is found, and how we as a people should present our message to those not of our faith. There is no end to the argument over the meaning of Bible texts. Those who must those who most vehemently oppose the idea of continuous revelation, while declaring that all answers are to be found in the Bible, are the least able to agree with each other on its meaning. And that was by Joseph Elam McConkie. Verse 13, At length I came to the conclusion that I must either uh, remain in darkness and confusion, or else I must do as, as James directs, that is, ask of God. I at length came to the determination to ask of God, concluding that if he gave wisdom to them that lacked wisdom and would give liberally and not upbraid, I, must, I might venture. It took Joseph about three years to decide to pray about his life and which church to join. This didn't happen just overnight. Verse 14, So in accordance with this, my determination to ask of God, I retired to the woods to make the attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful clear day, early in the spring of 1820, do we know the date of the first vision? He mentions here that it's a beautiful, clear day. John C. Lefgren has done a study of weather conditions in the spring of 1820 and the following findings. Here is what the narrative indicates. It was in the morning of a beautiful, clear day, early in the spring of 1820. Brother Lefgren indicates his belief that a beautiful day is an indication of a moderate temperature and no strong wind. He looked for days where the temperature was at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit, clear relates to the sky in the mornings and the possible days where there are no clouds, no snow, no sleet, and no rain. Spring in North America is March, April, and May. Early spring probably means between March 1st and April 15th. During this time, the Smith family harvested maple syrup and produced it. The last day of, in 1820 for harvesting the sap was Friday, March the 24th. On Saturday, they would have been still boiling the sap all that day. The first day, available for the boy to go to the grove to pray, would have been March 26th, a Sunday, a day of rest for the family. And by the way, it was Palm Sunday. According to U.S. Weather Bureau records of 1820, during the first two weeks of March, it snowed almost every day. Beginning on March 22nd, there is a break in the weather and it starts to warm up. March 24th, the weather is clear and the temperature is above 40 degrees. Saturday, March 25th, is also clear and warm. And Sunday, March 26th, is clear with a temperature of 56 degrees, the highest of any day that early spring. Monday, March 27th, the weather turns cloudy, the temperature drops, and the first week of April, there is snow, sleet, and rain. The weather doesn't clear again until April 15th. This most likely date is the date when they finish their maple sap harvesting and the weather is the, is the clearest. That date is Sunday, March 26, 1820. Oh, how lovely was the morning is the, is the publication that uh, talks about the 26th of March being the first vision. Although the date of the first vision was not recorded by the prophet and it has not been subsequently revealed to us, Using the two independent calculations, we can reasonably assume that this is the date that the date is correct, March 26, 1820. 
Continuing verse 14, it was the first time in my life that I had made such an attempt for amidst, amidst all my anxieties, I had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. Verse 15, and this is a scripture mastery verse. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. The first vision, as it is now known, took place in a grove of trees that the Smiths were clearing near their log home in Palmyra, New York. Recounting the experience, Joseph Smith said that he went to a clearing and went to the stump where I had struck my axe when I had quit work and I kneeled down and prayed. I had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. My tongue seemed to be swollen in my mouth so that I could not utter. I heard a noise behind me like someone walking towards me. I strove again to pray, but could not. The noise of walking seemed to draw nearer. I sprang upon my feet and looked around, but saw no person or thing that was calculated to produce the noise of walking. Telling the story of the first vision, Orson Hyde said, the adversary benighted his Joseph's mind with doubts and brought to his soul, his soul all kinds of improper pictures and tried to hinder him in his efforts and the accomplishment of his goal. I think at this point, uh, Satan is trying to make Joseph unworthy by putting images into his mind that were inappropriate and thus making him unworthy to have this first vision or the presence of God and Jesus. Um, anyway, that's just a thought that I had. Verse 16, but exerting, but exerting all my powers to God, to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. Notice that this is at the very moment of great alarm. It's the fourth watch God that uh, doesn't come until we're in our deepest extremities here. We have no language that can adequately describe the glories of heaven. Joseph also used the phrases pillar of fire and pillar of flame to describe the light which appeared as part of his vision. Orson Pratt wrote the earliest published account of the first vision in 1840, assuming that he had, assuming that he was accurately re, that boy oh boy I'm getting this wrong, assuming that he has accurately reflected the way Joseph Smith told the story. His account is very instructive. While thus pouring out his soul, he wrote, anxiously desiring an answer from God, he at length saw a very bright and glorious light in the heavens above, which at first seemed to be a considerable distance. He continued praying while the light appeared to be gradually descending towards him, and as it drew nearer, it increased in brightness and magnitude so that by the time it reached the tops of the trees, the whole wilderness for some distance around was illuminated in, in a most glorious and brilliant manner. He expected to have seen the leaves and boughs of the trees consumed as soon as the light came in contact with them, but perceiving that it did not produce that effect, he was encouraged with the hope of being able to endure its presence. It continued descending slowly until it rested upon the earth and he was enveloped in the midst of it. When it first came upon him, it produced a peculiar sensation throughout his whole system, and immediately his mind was caught away from the natural objects which, with which he was surrounded, and he was enwrapped in a heavenly vision. Verse 17. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. The first word spoken by God in this dispensation was Joseph, which is Hebrew for, He who gathers for God. God knows us personally. On another occasion, Joseph Smith said, A personage appeared in the midst of the fire of this pillar of flame, which was spread all around and yet nothing consumed, another personage soon appeared like unto the first. Alexander Nebar uh, heard Joseph Smith tell about the first vision in Nauvoo just two months before the prophet's martyrdom. According to his account, Joseph saw a personage in the fire of light complexion, blue eyes, a piece of white cloth drawn over his shoulders, his right arm bare. After a while, another person came to the side of the first. In the Wentworth letter, Joseph wrote that he saw two glorious personages who exactly resembled each other in features and likeness. 
Scriptures record three other occasions upon which the Father has spoken from the heavens. These are the Savior's baptism and on the Mount of Transfiguration in the Old World, as well as the introduction of Christ to the Nephites in the New World. Verse 18, My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, and that, that I might know which to join. No sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak, that I asked the personages who stood above me in the, in the light which of, the two, which of all the sects was right. For at this time it had never in, entered into my heart that all were wrong, and which I should join. So why Joseph Smith and why now? Elder McConkie said, there was a Calvin, a Zwingli, a Luther, a Wesley. There were wise and good men, morning stars who shone more brightly than their fellows, who arose in every nation. There were men of insight and courage who were sickened by the sins and evils of the night. These great souls hacked and sawed at the chains with which the masses were bound. They sought to do good and to help their fellow men. All according to the best light and knowledge they had. In Germany, in France, in England, in Switzerland, and elsewhere, groups began to break away from the religion of centuries past. A few rays of light were parting the darkness of the eastern sky. Many who sought freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience migrated to America, and in due course, by the power of the Father, a new nation was created, a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal. The United States of America came into being beyond the mountains, now not many leagues away, and a new day was, was gestating in the womb of nature. As the earth continued to turn slowly and steadily on its decreed course, as the dawn brightened and the morning light increased, as the Constitution of the United States guaranteed religious freedom, as men were tempered in their feelings and began to view each other more, with more equity and fairness, as the Bible was published and read by more people, as darkness fled and light increased, the time for the rising of the gospel sun was at hand. Also, the foreordination of Joseph Smith, which uh, even though there might have been lots of people that prayed to know the truth and to, to see the church restored, Joseph was the one that was foreordained to do it. Verse 19, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He again forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. Wouldn't you like to know what that was? When I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back, looking up into heaven. When the light had departed, I had, I, I had no strength, but soon recovering to some degree, I went home. And as I leaned up to the fireplace, mother inquired what the matter was. I replied, never mind, all is well. I am well enough off. And then I said to my mother, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. Notice that Joseph says, I learned for myself. And that's the challenge that we all have, is to learn the truth of these things for ourselves. It seems as though the adversary was aware at a very early period of my life that I was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of his kingdom. Else why should the powers of darkness combine against me? Why the opposition and persecution that arose against me almost in my infancy? Here's another heading to the next few verses. Some preachers and other professors of religion reject the account of the first vision. Persecution heaped upon Joseph Smith. He testifies of the reality of the vision. This is for verses 21 through 26. Some few days after I had this vision, I happened to be in company with one of the Methodist preachers who was very active in the, in the before-mentioned religious excitement and conversing with him on the, on the subject of religion. I took occasion to give him an account of the vision which I had had. I was greatly surprised at his behavior. He treated my communication not only lightly, but with great contempt, saying it was all of the devil, that there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days, that all such things had ceased with the apostles and that there would never be any more of them. I soon found, however, that my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against my, against me among professors of religion and was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase, and though I was an obscure boy only between 14 and 15 years of age, and my circumstances in life such as to make a boy of no consequence in the world, yet men of high standing would take notice sufficient to excite the public mind against me and create a bitter persecution, and this was common among all the sects, all united to persecute me." 
It caused me serious reflection then, and often has since, how very strange it was that an obscure boy of a little over fourteen years of age, and one too, who was doomed to the necessity of obtaining a scanty maintenance by his daily labor, should be thought a character of sufficient importance to attract the attention of the great ones of the most popular sects of the day, and in a manner to create in them a spirit of the most bitter persecution and reviling. But strange or not, so it was, and, and it was often the cause of great sorrow to myself. However, it was nevertheless a fact that I had beheld a vision. I have thought since that I felt much like Paul when he, was, when he made his defense before King Agrippa and related the account of the vision he had had when he saw a light and heard a voice, but still there were but few who believed him. Some said he was dishonest, others said he was mad, and he was, reviled, he was ridiculed and reviled. But all this did not destroy the reality of his vision. He had seen a vision, he knew he had, and all the persecution under heaven could not make it otherwise. And though they should persecute him unto death, yet he knew, and would know of, uh, to his latest breath, that he had both seen a light and heard a voice speaking unto him, and all the world could not make him think or believe otherwise. So it was with me. I had actually seen a light, and in the midst of that light I saw two personages, and they did in reality speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. And while they were persecuting me, reviling me, and speaking all manner of evil against me falsely for so saying, I was led to say in my heart, Why persecute me for telling the truth? I have actually seen a vision, and who am I that I can withstand God? Or why does the world think to make me deny what I have actually seen? For I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it, neither dared I do it. At least I knew that by so doing I would offend God and come under condemnation. And now, uh, I had now got my mind satisfied, so far as the sectarian world was concerned, that it was not my duty to join with any of them, but to continue as I was until further directed. I had found the testimony of James to be true, that a man who lacked wisdom might ask of God and obtain and not be upbraided. I bear testimony that these things are true and that Joseph Smith did have this vision, um, that the accounts, uh, all different accounts, uh, make it a much richer uh, experience and that we can uh, have a testimony that these things are true and we can know for ourselves that these things are true. I have... Um, studied and prayed and fasted about this first vision and know that these things are true. And I bear that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.